February 21st, 2021. At 36,000 feet above northeastern New Mexico, American Airlines Flight 2292 had an unusual encounter. Uh, 2292. Have any targets up here? We just had something go right over the top of us. First reported at the drive's war zone by investigative journalist Tyler Rogaway, the encounter was confirmed by American Airlines, and the air traffic control recordings were authenticated. I hate to say this looked like a long cylindrical object. It almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast and went right over the top of them. But beyond that, the airline recommended to contact the FBI. This indicated there was an investigation potentially underway, and that meant to me that there were documents to be found. Although I didn't have high hopes of groundbreaking results, I attempted to get a hold of the information via the Freedom of Information Act. The end result made the entire saga much more interesting, but it may have also produced more questions than answers. Here's the story about how it all went down. So stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., creator and founder of TheBlackVault.com. And I'll admit to you up front, when I originally was going to do this video, it was going to be very, very short. We call them quick blasts here on the channel. And I just literally do that in a very quick manner, tell you guys a story. Sometimes they're a couple minutes, sometimes they're a minute or two, uh, sometimes they've got me in them, sometimes they don't. But regardless, much, much smaller, which was, was my intent for this. Now, although I don't plan to go on too long, why? I wanted to point that out is the story took kind of an interesting turn after I published a small article yesterday. I call it small because it was just that. I was just updating you guys on the investigation into um, American Airlines Flight 2292. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this video is this video uh, is now going to update you guys on a new development. Now, let me tell you just in a nutshell what the article was yesterday. For those who don't know, American Airlines Flight 2292 on February 21st, 2021 had a strange encounter, just like you just saw in the in the introduction. Now, what I did was I kind of saw the, the great reporting by Tyler Rogaway. I'm a huge fan of his and what they do over there at The Drive and utilize that to create FOIA requests to track down documentation. Now, admittedly, I'm sure they were doing it too, and I was in no way trying to step on, on their toes, uh, either Tyler's or anybody at the team over there, but rather just start digging in, using that reporting, and kudos to them for breaking the story, but seeing what you can come up officially. I'm a big fan of tackling issues like that on multiple fronts because you never know, and this is a prime example of just that, who may get something where the other person does not. And sometimes it is either just down to luck, maybe it is malicious, I'll let you guys decide, but that happened in this case. So when I posted that out yesterday, I posted two letters. When I went after information about this encounter, uh, by American Airlines Flight 2292, I sent a couple FOIA requests out. One to the FBI, because according to American Airlines, they were essentially the contact to go to. That was reported by the drive. So that gave me a reason to go to the FBI. The more obvious one was the FAA. And that was essentially the, the um, in my opinion, the best spot for information on this encounter. But hey, with the FOIA, whenever in doubt, send it to everybody and see what happens. So here's the story about how that all 
went down because when I published that that article yesterday, I thought that that was somewhat, at least for now, the end of the story. I have appealed both cases. Now, here are the articles that were published by the war zone. Again, this is just the groundwork that allowed me to do that for you. You can see here, let me turn my little pen on here for those watching on YouTube. So this article up here, whoops, now I'm drawing on my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I wanted. Here's my laser pointer. So this was the February 21st article. Uh, airliner encountered unidentified fast-moving cylindrical object over New Mexico. That was when the story was broken on February 21st. Digging in more, as Tyler does best, two days later they published this one. American Airlines confirms encounter with unidentified cylindrical object over New Mexico. Now, I gave you the nutshell version. Here's a little bit more about what the encounter was. On the February 21st article, Tyler wrote, American Airlines Flight 2292, an Airbus A320 flying between Cincinnati and Phoenix on February 21st, 2021. They had a bizarre encounter with what its crew described as a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile, moving extremely fast over the top of their aircraft as it crushed along at 36,000 feet and 400 knots. The incident occurred over the remote northeast corner of New Mexico to the west of the tiny town of Des Moines. Now, two days later, as I said, Tyler published a update. He says, less than 48 hours after our initial reporting on an outright strange incident involving America Airlines Flight 2292 as it flew at 36,000 feet over the northeastern corner of New Mexico, on February 21st, 2021, we have confirmation that the event in question did indeed occur and that it is being investigated by the FBI. The incident involved pilots of the Airbus A320 being buzzed by an unidentified cylindrical shaped object moving at high speed, which resulted in them querying the FAA's Albuquerque Air Route Traffic Control Center. That was the reporting. So you can see here that there was there was this encounter and the FBI and the FAA would be the most logical place to go. Now, Tyler also published the actual air traffic control recording. You heard a little bit of it on the uh, introduction. Let me go ahead and play the rest of it here. Get, uh, 2292. Have any targets up here? We just had something go right over the top of us that I hate to say this looked like a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast that went right over the top of it. Now that was the, the, the recording between the pilot and the and the and the traffic control center. So utilizing that reporting, that's what you use as a basis for FOIA requests. For those FOIA people out there, if you're looking for ideas, the the news media is the best place for that. Now, Tyler's an exception to what I'm about to say, meaning Tyler keeps digging. Joe over there as well, he keeps digging. That team over there is why I respect them, because they continue digging. Most media outlets do not. In fact, most media outlets don't even use the FOIA at all. They will get you know an anonymous source or some kind of source or somebody in the know. They report on something, and then they, they move on. They don't go back to it. It's a great source for what I call FOIA fodder. You look for stories that might be of interest. And I mean, unless you're looking for, you know, breaking a, a brand new story, even though you might be, again, not breaking a brand new story, that's a great tactic when you want to expand on the story. You see things and sometimes you will find something that is more breaking news. Uh, but again, it's just a great way to dig in and find documentation. So that's that's an example here. But again, I do want to credit uh, Tyler and, and Joseph and everybody over there at the drive for digging in themselves. And I'm sure that they were that they were doing the same. Here is the FBI letter that I had talked about uh, a few moments ago, where on March 2nd, and I filed on February 24th, that is going to be key uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So so put a pin in that I filed on February 24th, March 2nd, they send me this letter that they were unable to identify records responsive to my request. Now my request 
as you can see here in black and white, was about American Airlines Flight 2292 on February 21st, 2021, about an encounter with an unknown object over New Mexico. You can't get more specific than that in the eyes of the FOIA. Sometimes if you don't know a date, then you could run into a problem. If you don't know a location, you can run into a problem. If you don't know a flight number, you could potentially run into a problem. But this particular case, as indicated here, had everything on there. There was no reason that they shouldn't find documents. So they sent me this no records. I believe I tweeted this out. I couldn't find it prior to uh, recording this presentation. I think I did. Uh, it wasn't even an article. I just tweeted it out and said the FBI said they didn't find anything and um, kind of moved on because there's there's really nothing you can do other than appeal, which I did, and then it's a waiting game. And I'm still waiting, by the way, for that appeal, uh, but more on that again in a moment. Here's the FAA letter. This one dated June 21st, 2021, just a day ago from the recording of this. They say, we can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the records that you seek. What was I seeking? Same deal. American Airlines Flight 2292 and the encounter on February 21st, 2021. They also cited a very interesting exemption, uh, which is B7E. Now, generally, this uh, involves law enforcement investigation material. So they don't want to essentially blow their cover, uh, so to speak, on how they conduct law enforcement investigations or hinder a law enforcement investigation. So what was weird here, and I'll read the whole paragraph now, pursuant to FOIA exemptions B7E, the FAA neither confirms nor denies the existence of records which would indicate whether an individual or organization is or has ever been of investigatory interest of the federal government. Further acknowledging federal government interest invites the risk of circumvention of federal law enforcement efforts. Therefore, we can neither confirm nor deny the existence of records that you seek. Now, I felt that I had an appeal here. I could very well be shot down, um, so to speak. But the appeal was that they were citing a law enforcement uh, exemption they didn't want to, in essence, say that American Airlines was under investigation, but that's not what the request was about. The request was about the investigation of an incident, and therefore no rights would be infringed upon on a personal or a corporate level, meaning they're not, they're not essentially libeling, slandering, or uh, incriminating any type of organization or individual. Rather, I was asking about a certain incident. So I believe that gave me grounds for an appeal. Uh, we'll see what happens, but I appealed that. Now I want to go back to the FBI. As I mentioned in the top of this video, I published that very short article profiling the letters that I just went over, profiling the reporting by the drive and why I believe that the FAA and or the FBI had responsive records, okay? So that, that's, that's the, the overview. About a few hours after I published that, uh, Robert Powell, a friend of this show, friend of mine for many years, you guys know him well, had written me and we were starting to talk. I know he's been going after the FOIA as well, uh, going after the documents via the FOIA as well. And he had gotten the same denial. So he saw my post, we started chatting. He had told me about another contact and friend of mine who I've worked with um, on and off for many, many years. He runs the UFO, um, or he runs UFOs Northwest, I should say, is, is his organization name. And what he does with UFOs Northwest is, is very similar to like the UFO Reporting Center, is he brings in UFO cases that are sent to him, investigates them where he can, he posts videos, posts photos, and his name is William Puckett. Now, uh, I also worked with him when I produced for UFO Hunters. I, I know that the series itself, even well before I joined on season three, had utilized uh, Mr. Puckett, uh, Mr. Puckett many, many, many times. So he's very well known, uh, very knowledgeable. And in fact, you may actually see him on this channel very soon, hint, hint. Uh, but uh, that being said, he had also filed a FOIA request to the FBI, and he posted documents about Air American Airlines Flight 2292 and the UFO encounter from the FBI. Now you could be saying, hey, wait a minute, you just showed me a letter that said it was denied. 
that they couldn't find anything. Well, you're absolutely right. And remember when I said earlier also that it's good to tackle this on multiple fronts with multiple people because you never know what happens. Why did they tell me they had nothing when in fact they had four pages? I don't know. And I'm still researching that. I sent a very stern letter to the FBI stating that I had to go through the song and dance of an appeal, which sometimes does not take three and a half seconds to produce. You have to sit down, write it, and outline why you're appealing a final, a final decision and submit it. Why I had to do that when in reality there were documents that existed, I don't have an answer to that for you, but I did write to them and say, look, this is ridiculous that we all had to waste our time when at the end of the day, you guys did have documents and sent it to another investigator. So my credit 100% for these documents goes to Mr. William Puckett. So thank you to him. I uh, talked to him on the phone earlier today. We were unable to do an interview for this video. However, stay tuned to the channel because you'll see him coming up soon uh, in the next few days. But I did ask him if I could go over with full credit to him the documents he did get. Of course, he was all over that and all for it because he wanted to share this with all of you guys as well. So for those watching, I'm going to show you the documents. For those listening, I'm going to read through them a little bit as well. That way you guys get an understanding of what the FBI actually had. Now, like I said, there were four pages. This was the first page. You'll notice here the date of March 2nd, 2021. This is called an import form. For those taking notes, it's a form called FD 1036. And essentially, you find this quite a bit in FBI files. They're generally, I would say, I don't want to call it a cover sheet, but essentially you find this at the top of the stack, so to speak. It's the synopsis of the particular case or incident. Uh, it tells you a little bit of background, and then it goes into greater detail, which I'll show you in a moment. So this was the first page. I'm going to read to you here the highlighted portion of the FBI document. Um, American Airlines Flight 2292 and Airbus A320 flying from Cincinnati to Phoenix on 22121 had a bizarre close encounter with what the crew described as a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile moving extremely fast over the top of their aircraft at a cruised along at 36,000 feet at 400 knots. The incident occurred over the northwest corner of New Mexico to the west of the town of Des Moines, located east of Raton. American Airlines is instructing reporters to contact FBI Albuquerque. What's interesting here, and uh, Mr. Puckett actually pointed this out to me, I missed it. Uh, they're wrong here. It was the northeast corner, which is where uh, Des Moines was, was located or is located, and that's where the incident took place. So regardless, though, they're kind of setting the synopsis up of the case. And that's how they described it, very similar uh, to how Tyler Rogaway had reported it. Here's page two. Now, for those savvy minds, you're going to see right here the status of the case within the FBI's holdings. And that says closed on 3-2-2021. And underneath that does not fall within the FBI's jurisdiction. Put a pin in that. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. You're going to see a big white box here. Yes, that is all redacted under B7E, same exemption as cited by the FAA. You see this a lot in FBI files for just that. They're a law enforcement agency. They don't like to talk about the details of a certain investigation to blow their tactics and stuff like that. The exemption B7 breaks down into multiple different subsections and defines, again, where they don't want to reveal too much about their law and uh, law in enforcement investigative processes and that is where b7 falls in this i believe is probably the most interesting part in my opinion but it's all redacted down here you'll see uh, pretty much what i just read to you i'm not going to read it again but more of the synopsis on the case this is the summary so you'll see that i read to you the synopsis then it gets into more detail in this report and this form Incident summary. So again, they kind of go over the same deal. Then it drills down into the notes. I'm going to read to you the notes. Administrative note for informational purposes. On 224-21, Ryder reached out to the FAA office in Albuquerque. The FAA is currently aware of the news articles that have been written on the incident. The FAA is currently checking their systems to determine if their equipment picked up other aircraft in the area of American Airlines Flight 2292 at the top of the flight was in the northeastern 
region of New Mexico. So there, that was that was correct with Northeast. This is the bottom part of that note on page three. You'll see that it's 224, 2021. That is the first note in that uh, document on February 24th. And you'll see here other notes that were added. Again, I won't go through all of them. I invite you to look in the show notes below that will link you over to the actual uh, document and, and written article where you can download these, see these, see Tyler's articles, so on and so forth. I'm going to jump down here to 225. I'm going to read to you that. This is when they contacted the uh, Los Animas. I'm, I probably have that pronounced incorrectly, so I'm sorry to all those in Arizona who, or in New Mexico, I should say, uh, that just cringed at my pronunciation. Interview or request information from members of the public and private entities. On February 25th, 2021, at approximately 1020 a.m., special agent blacked out, spoke to blacked out, who worked for Las Animas Sheriff's Office Dispatch. He advised no reports were made in regards to objects descend descending from the sky or objects that had crashed in the area. We'll contact special agent again redacted or special agent redacted at the Albuquerque FBI field office if future reports are obtained. Again, that was the 25th. Uh, those redactions, by the way, are very, very common. They don't reveal special agent names. And here you'll see a couple more notes. Again, I invite you to read all of that at the link below. Here's page four, the last page. I'm gonna, again, you can see the sections here. I'm gonna jump down, not read everything to you. Uh, but there's a, a section called disposition. I'm gonna read to you that. A few lines blacked out and redacted, what you can read. After consultation with FBI Albuquerque Chief Division Counsel, it was concluded the FBI does not have federal jurisdiction to investigate this matter. Therefore, this matter is being closed for information only. However, if additional information presents itself within the scope of FBI's federal jurisdiction, the FBI could reopen this assessment and perform any investigative actions deemed necessary to have a successful resolution. Last line under disposition, does not fall within the FBI's jurisdiction. Why is that? And I'm, I'm not sure. I'm still trying to research this a little bit. But this ties into a much bigger question. And this will be a future video. But I'm going to pose this question to you guys right now. As you know, the FBI has wound up in the Senate Intelligence Committee's request for the information from this particular agency and others to be evaluated by the UAP task force and for the upcoming UAP report, hopefully due any day now from the posting of this video. If the FBI can't investigate what is clearly an unknown object flying near an airline, then what is it that they're doing? Because any military encounter is likely going to be done by the military. I mean, they, I've, I've got documents to show that when a drone went into a Navy installation, I believe it was San Diego, uh, it was NCIS that investigated that. So the military has investigative arms for encroachments on their own installations. So why is the FBI seemingly so prevalent in some of these mentions about the UAP task force, this UAP report, so on and so forth? This seems to me cut and dry. It could be a drone. It could be something man-made. You know, let's not go the alien route with this. All I'm saying is if it's not the jurisdiction of the FBI, then why are they so uh, prevalently mentioned uh, as of late? And, you know, that's still kind of, in my opinion, unfolding. Maybe we'll find more about the report. Last thing I'm going to go over here before I show one last thing to you, and then we're going to end this is at the end of this form is what's called the workflow. Essentially, this summarizes all of the different entries. So remember I said 224 was when they, they put the first note. That's when they created the incident. So it kind of makes a very small summation of what happened with this particular incident, broken down by date and time, all the way to March 2nd, closed as information only, obviously because the disposition states not part of the FBI's jurisdiction. Okay, so that 
is this particular FBI form, this incident report broken down? This is not unique to unknown encounters of airliners. Again, you find these in a ton of FBI files on theblackvault.com. I have quite a few of them. It is a fairly common thing to see nowadays. Here's the last thing, though, I'm going to point out to you guys. Maybe you picked up on it as I was going through the dates. I told you to put a pin in February 24th, 2021, because that was when I faxed to the FBI that FOIA request. It says eight pages. Uh, That was actually multiple FOIA requests. So generally, I fax them together. That way, I just don't keep hanging up and faxing again and hanging up and faxing again. Yes, I do fax because I hate their what's called the PAL system. I do use it periodically, but for the most part, I fax. It's a lot easier. It's a lot faster. uh, And I wish they did email, but they don't. They took that away. So regardless, there's my proof. There's the fax receipt. uh, 4.03 p.m. That is Pacific time. Here's that workflow section I talked to you about. 2.24.2021. Maybe a pure coincidence that the FOIA request that I had sent in, uh, what time is this? 7.22 p.m.? Is it Eastern? Is it Pacific? I'm not really sure. But regardless, within a couple of hours, they created the incident report and started creating notes that evening about the inquiries that we're getting. I've already gone over I was not the only one, so please do not think that I am insinuating that I was. What I found interesting, though, is that the case was started the day that I put the FOIA request in. So how is it that on March 2nd, I yielded that no records response, that they were unable to find anything? Notice, however, one other really weird coincidence. March 2nd, 2021 is when they sent that denial to me and said, hey, sorry, Greenwald, we can't find anything. And yet internally, when the documents went to William Puckett, Look at the date of that final page or what I call that final page. It's it's just not technically that. March 2nd, 2021, the same exact day that they essentially closed out the incident report and saying that it wasn't FBI's jurisdiction was reflected by the same exact day they sent out this no records response to me. Now, what I learned with my conversation today with William Puckett was that he as well received a no records response. However, and he let it go. He didn't appeal. He didn't pursue it any farther. But then after had received the FBI letter in the beginning of June that uh, that essentially released the records. So that to me is a, <laughs> I, I won't say it. I don't, I don't want to talk bad about any FOIA office, but I hope that I showed you guys that I clearly described the records. And what is really weird is that, again, the date of my request reflects the date the incident was created, and the date that I was denied is the date when they closed their case. Now, some may ask, if the case is open, can they lie? And of course they can lie. We've seen that countless times that I've profiled it on this channel. They're just not supposed to. But would it give them the freedom to say, hey, we've got nothing on this when the case was still open? And uh, I believe the answer to that would be no, they would not have the freedom. I have multiple cases I can cite with the FBI where I requested information on an individual and the investigation was still open. They didn't deny it. They didn't say that there were no records, but rather they denied it because the investigation was open, and that is exemption B7. So they will cite something when it is open, and clearly this was open during the processing of my request. And yet they said, nope, sorry, we couldn't find anything. So their action here for those who, again, may pose the, well, maybe they just, you know, denied it because it was still open. That does not coincide with a provable documented history of how the FBI actually handles themselves in cases and situations like this. What does that all mean? Well, you decide. It's pretty frustrating for me because I had that request in. It was properly identified and and described 
and I was denied anyway. And that is very frustrating. I'm trying to choose my words carefully there. But I'm always interested in what you guys have to say. So if you are watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Please, please give me a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel and post your comments below. If you're listening on any podcast form, uh, any podcast platform, please you please know I aim for five stars. So if you can take a moment, review the podcast. But hey, if you want to see some of these visuals, see me go over them, go to the blackvault.com slash live, and that will bounce you to the YouTube channel. And that way, you guys can see the uh, presentation that you're currently listening to. But whichever way you are watching or listening, thank you so much for doing so. It's greatly appreciated. I hope you learned at least one thing on this video. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.